All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to this session. Um, so this is the Lick Observatory Ask an Astronomer panel. Um, so I just, my name is Emily, uh, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley. Uh, I just want to go over the format of the questions real quick. Um, so there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you have a question, just type it in there. Um, and try not to duplicate questions. So you'll see a little upvote or downvote, um, or sorry, just upvote um, option at the side of each question. So if you see a duplicate question, you can just upvote that one um, instead of asking again. Um, and this is a limited time panel, so we might not be able to get to everybody's question. Um, so feel free um, without like spamming the question box to kind of ask more than one if, if you're curious about um, a couple different things and we'll, we'll try to get to most of them. All right, um, so now I will turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves um, and then Ellie will give us a little introduction to Lick Observatory. So hi, I'm Ellie Gates and I am a resident astronomer at Lick Observatory and uh, I study a couple different things at Lick Observatory. Uh, one is uh, supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies and how they interact with the stuff nearby. Um, and I also work with the actual hardware here at the observatory with the telescopes and helping to build and improve the various cameras and instruments, in particular, the adaptive optics system that gives us clearer views through the telescope. So, maybe I'll turn it over to my colleague Paul now. Hello, everyone. My name is Paul Lynham. I'm also a resident astronomer at the observatory here on Mount Hamilton, just on the uh, eastern edge of Santa Clara County. Like Ellie, I also support some of the hardware and I help to uh, assist the, all the astronomers from around the University of California system and often around the world to use the facilities, some of the nine telescopes we have here on the mountain. And uh, I also do a little bit of my own research when I get the time. I am interested in giant galaxies and clusters of galaxies and the large scale structure of the universe. And uh, then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, John. Thanks, Paul. So I'm John Rees. And like Ellie and Paul, I'm a resident astronomer up here at Lick Observatory. Um, so much like them, most of my work is based on training new observers and supporting existing, uh, existing observers uh, to use our telescopes. Uh, and then in terms of my own research, uh, I study uh, groups of stars, uh, both nearby to us and further away in our own galaxy to determine ages and chemi chemical compositions. So at this point, um, I'm going to share my screen. So I'll show you a few slides. Um, first, just to let you know where we are. We're at Lick Observatory, which sits on top of Mount Hamilton, which is a 4,200 feet elevation. It is the highest peak in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, Lick Observatory is about a one hour drive east of San Jose. Um, and during normal times, we're open to the public, though right now things are a little strange because of the COVID pandemic and uh, the fire, the SCU fire burned through the facility in August. So uh, we're still recovering from that. But uh, we hope we'll be open to the public sometime soon and you can come visit us. Uh, so the observatory is named for James Lick. You can see him faintly in the background of the slide. Uh, he was a wealthy businessman in San Francisco back in the 1800s. And in fact, the richest man in California in the early 1870s. And he wanted a monument to himself. And so he had the 36 inch refracting telescope constructed. At the time, it was the largest telescope in the world and really put Lick Observatory on the map as a world-class research facility. And we have continued that up to the present day, doing all sorts of great astronomy and uh, discoveries. Uh, our telescopes today, our major telescopes on Mount Hamilton are the three meter Shane reflector. It's 120 inches or 10 feet in diameter. So it's a large telescope. It was the second largest telescope in the world when it was constructed in the 1950s. 
has lots of different cameras and instruments we can put on it to do pretty much any sort of science you want to do with our telescopes from looking at planets. Uh, we look at Neptune and Uranus, uh, as well as some of the other planets in our solar system, uh, asteroids, galaxies, stars, clusters of stars. Um, you know, we've even discovered planets around other stars with this telescope. Uh, and in fact, we were so successful with discovering stars around or planets around other stars that we got money to build the automated planet finder, which is a robotic telescope to find exoplanets. Uh, it's 2.4 meters in diameter, so the second largest telescope on Mount Hamilton. We have another robotic telescope called the Katzmann Automatic Imaging Telescope, and its purpose is to discover supernova explosions in other galaxies. And finally, I want to mention our uh, third largest telescope on Mount Hamilton. It's the Nickel 1 meter or 40 inch diameter telescope. And it has various cameras and instruments, including instruments that look for laser signals from extraterrestrial life. So it hasn't discovered any yet, but we're hoping it will eventually. So that's just a very quick summary of the sorts of things we do. And I hope this will uh, inspire you with some interesting questions for us. All right. So we can get started with the questions. Um, we have one uh, that says, I know scientists have found water on Mars. Does that mean aliens are real? So yeah, the, the water that's been found on Mars right now that we, we can detect uh, is all frozen. Um, so we, we don't know if there's alien life on Mars. Um, there might have been in the past. And some of the space probes that we've sent to Mars that are landing there, the rovers, um, have been looking for some of the chemical signals that might indicate there had been life on Mars in the past when it was warmer and wetter, um, we think, in the past, billions of years ago. Um, but we haven't detected anything definitively yet on Mars that indicates whether it had life or has life now. But we're certainly looking. And there's a large group of uh, astronomers and engineers and scientists at NASA who work on those programs. Cool. Um, I have another one, maybe a good one also for you, Ellie. Um, is where are good locations in the Bay Area where the general public can go to photograph astronomical objects like the Milky Way or Neowise, like in your background? Yeah, so it may be the, the picture I'm using in my background, which is a picture of Comet Neowise, I took back in July when it was easily visible. Um, Lick Observatory uh, is not usually open after dark. So I can't say that we're a great place for the public to come and do nighttime viewing unless you come to one of our ticketed nighttime events. And we do actually have during the summertime um, photography nights where we uh, you can buy a ticket and come up and set up your camera and telescope and do astrophotography um, and nighttime photography here. Um, but nearby to Lick Observatory with skies that are pretty dark is uh, Joseph Grant County Park. And they have a lovely campground and they have star parties every month that you can attend, uh, or at least we hope they'll start up again once uh, the COVID uh, restrictions ease some. Um, and of course, there are plenty of open space areas around the Bay Area. So any of those that are open at night and get you a little bit away from the city lights is a, a great place to go to uh, do nighttime photography of the sky or the city lights. All right. Um, one other question that can potentially be extended a little bit is where is the telescope? And an extension to that would be why was it built where it was built? John or Paul, do you want to take it? So I can respond to that one. The, the telescope is built on the summit of Mount Hamilton, as Eddie showed you in that picture, some 4,200 feet above sea level. It's about 13 miles to the east of the downtown of San Jose, 
and you have to drive this serpentine mountain road to get to the top. It will take you about an hour. And the reason one of the lick is famous, the observatory is famous, is because it's the first professional observatory that was placed or deliberately built on a high site. And there are advantages to that. You get above a lot of the smog of the cities and the light pollution and so on. And the atmosphere is slightly more stable as well. And by being the first one, lit set the, set the standard and set the trend. Because prior to this project being rolled out here in Santa Clara, most observatories were on university campuses or in cities or close to harbours because the astronomers were the keepers of time. And the ships in the harbours were setting their spring marine chronometers to go navigating around the world. So the idea of actually placing an observatory deliberately at high elevation to avoid some of the, the contaminating effects of the atmosphere enabled us to get higher quality data. And nearly every observatory now, modern observatory, is placed deliberately at an isolated, typically high and dry site. Cool. Um, so I have a question for each of you individually. Um, what got you interested in being an astronomer and how did you end up working at Lick Observatory specifically? Well, maybe I'll start it off. Um, I can't actually remember a time where I wasn't interested in astronomy. Um, I remember being a kid and seeing all these great science document documentaries about you know, the expanding universe and galaxies and how they formed and the black holes at their cores and how we didn't know much about them. And, uh, you know, and I do remember being a small child going outside with my dad to look at Comet Kahootek and later uh, Comet, uh, Halley's Comet when it came around. And uh, so, so that, that sort of inspiration in my scientific background family. So uh, I have a family full of scientists, uh, physicists, chemists, mathematicians, as well. Um, so it's not surprising I went into a scientific field. And when I discovered that you could major in astronomy in college, I was like, woohoo, this is great. And uh, was able to indulge my lifelong love of the sky. And uh, I was extremely fortunate when Lick Observatory was looking for a staff member with uh, specialization in an instrumentation called adaptive optics, which I had worked on as a graduate student at the University of New Mexico. And uh, uh, so it was just, just a dream come true that they hired me and I've been here over 20 years now at Lick Observatory. Maybe John can go next. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so unsurprisingly, I'll say the same thing where uh, when I was uh, a young kid, I was always interested in in space and had all you know ton of books on the bookshelf. Um, it kind of helped growing up in a in a rural area because the, there was very little sky pollution there, so it was very easy to see the night sky. Um, but I didn't really consider astronomy as a career until well into my kind of undergraduate graduate career. I didn't really know that that was a a viable career path um, for, for, uh, for me. Um, and I kind of stumbled into it. Um, I started when I went to, to university, I said, ah, well, I'll, I'll study astrophysics. That'll be fun. I like space. That's interesting. If I'm going to do something for four years, make sure it's something I, I find interesting. Um, and yeah, I just kind of stumbled along ever since then. Of I then learned you could do graduate studies and do a PhD in, in astronomy. And that sounds like a great idea to you know, get paid to continue to do research and and uh, study space. So, um, and then I was very lucky after that to get a, offered a research position um, over here in the US. Um, it was a joint appointment between the University of Arizona and UC San Diego. And when I came to UC San Diego, I uh, used the telescopes up at Lick. Um, and at that point, kind of decided this is what I want to do. This is ideally, you know, where I want to work. And again, I was very fortunate with the timing that they just happened to have a job opening opening at around that time. So I was uh, very fortunate with the timing there. Um, but yeah, for me, it was definitely kind of a always interested in space, but definitely a stumbled into the career rather than set out on day one with the idea of I am going to be a professional astronomer. 
Yeah, so for me, it's similar, but slightly different. So I was about six years old and it was a summer evening just after sunset. And I was looking out of the window of my bedroom that I shared with my older brother. And it's memorable for two reasons, because it's one of the few times I can remember being in the same room as my brother and not fighting. And the other memorable reason is because we both together saw a giant green fireball go from right to left across the horizon, flaring and flickering shadows and casting the shadows of the trees on the garden. So we saw the, the shadows of the trees kind of swing in the opposite direction as this fireball went across the sky. And there was a stunned silence between my brother and myself. And my brother said, did you see that? And then I went, yeah. And then he said, that was a comet. And that's when we started fighting because we argued about whether it was a comet or not. Now, I didn't know what it was, but uh, I know it wasn't a comet for some reason. I don't know how. So I then went to my primary or my elementary school library and got a book out about astronomy to prove my brother wrong. And uh, I fell in love with the pictures in the book, the, the pictures of the galaxies and the nebulae and all the beautiful colours. It was almost like art. So um, after seeing these pictures, then I wanted to see those things for myself. So the next step after winning the argument with my brother, so this is all my brother's fault, um, and my parents still don't believe me, I, I wanted to see those things, so I needed a telescope. And where I grew up, we didn't have the opportunity, we didn't really have the, the access to a telescope. So the next best thing was to use other people. So that's where I started on this idea of, well, if I, if I study hard and go to school, I can probably get to use some of the professionals' uh, telescopes. And I've been very lucky, like Ellie and John, you're being able to travel around the world and use a lot of the telescopes all over the world now. So it's still a buzz, still a privilege to walk in through the door of an observatory for me. It's almost an immersive cinematic experience. Awesome. Um, all right, so I have a couple questions here about planets and dwarf planets. Um, let me see the first one. Uh, is Ceres a planet or an asteroid or a dwarf planet? I guess maybe a little bit on the distinction between those. <laughs> so, so believe it or not, Ceres has been classified as all of the above at one point or another. Um, when Ceres was first discovered, and I can't remember off the top of my head exactly when that was, but it was considered the eighth planet in our solar system. It was big and round. And then they discovered that, wow, there are lots of other objects with orbits sort of similar to it um, in that span between Mars and Jupiter, that's the main asteroid belt. And so they actually decided to call these minor planets or asteroids. And so Ceres got downgraded from a planet to an asteroid. And it's now asteroid number one. Uh, so, it, and it's one of the biggest asteroids um, out there. And then later on, Pluto was discovered and it was considered the ninth planet in our solar system. And then once again, as astronomers learned more and discovered more objects out there past Neptune and and uh, you know, that were sort of in similar orbits and kind of smaller. And uh, they said, oh, there's this new class of object, you know, that, that Pluto really doesn't quite fit with the bigger major planets in our solar system. It's kind of small, it has elliptical orbit, a much more oval orbit around the sun. There are other objects sort of like it. And so astronomers came up with this new category called a dwarf planet. And so Pluto got demoted a lot like Ceres did and became sort of the prototypical dwarf planet. Um, and Ceres also sort of meets this criteria for dwarf planet. They're big enough so that they're round, their, their self gravity makes them, you know, round. Um, so, you know, but it is sort of a continuum that the, the definitions are changing as we learn more. So a lot of people are disappointed that Pluto was demoted from planet status, um, but it's the first of the dwarf planet. So it's like, yay, number one, Pluto. Um, so it's how you look at it. But, you know, this is the nature of science is that these things keep changing as we learn more and have to adjust our definitions and our understanding of how these things form and where they fit. Um, I don't know, John or Paul, you wanna add anything? 
no, I think that's. Uh, I think it's a case of this is what we understand for now. These are our current definitions. Be prepared for change. So we have one more follow-up question on what's the difference between an asteroid and a dwarf planet? Is it is it just size? I would say it's from my in my perspective. I'd, I'm not an expert on planets for sure. I think it depends a little bit probably on the subtleties of um, the definitions that are in use presently. So there are some secondary categories and criteria about how a dwarf planet must clear some of its orbit of, of smaller objects and things like that. And also I think Ceres is kind of in an orbit between Mars and Jupiter, which was our traditional view of where asteroids are. Um, and of course now as time has gone on, we've found that there are asteroids that are in the same orbit as Earth, that cross Earth, and that go all the way out towards the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt and so on. And you'll see even our ideas of how asteroids behave are varying all the time. Just in these past few days, we've had the OSIRIS-REx um, tag event, and they were surprised at how much material was liberated. And even prior to that, they were even thinking that it may be a hybrid object because it was outguessing, or it appeared to be outguessing a bit like a comet. So even the definitions on our understanding is changing almost in real time. We are living through these revelations and discoveries about whether these things are asteroids or comets or both. All right. Cool. Um, let's do, I guess, one more, one more question on planets and then we can, we've got a, a bunch about black holes next. <laughs> um, so this one is, is planet nine real? And how would we, how would we know if it, if it was real or wasn't real? So, so that's actually a tough one to answer. I mean, Planet Nine, there is some evidence there might be some massive body way out in the far reaches of our, our solar system. And, um, you know, we, we see the evidence from the orbits of the other very distant objects out there in the solar system. Um, so some of these dwarf planets and asteroids that are way out there um, seem to have orbits that tend to be biased a little bit, like uh, there's a more massive body out there that's changing their orbits and uh, making them clump together in a statistically unusual way. Um, and so they infer that there's another massive body, maybe as big as Neptune, which is, you know, one of our bigger gas giant planets out there. They haven't seen it yet. And of course, it's so far away. It's really cold. It's so far away. It doesn't reflect a lot of sunlight. It's going to be really, really hard to find if it exists. Um, so, but uh, I, I, I know people are looking for it, uh, but there are some people that think that maybe they're interpreting the data wrong. So it may not actually exist, um, but uh, we'll just keep looking and see what we find. All right. Uh, and I'm seeing a couple of hand raises from the participants. Just a reminder, if you have a question, there is a little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So just type your question in there if you have one. Um, so moving on to some questions about black holes. Uh, what is inside a black hole? <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I'm dominating. I should let my colleagues speak some, but- <laughs> John, to... John, do you want to take one? <laughs> oh, no, go, go ahead, Ellie. Uh... <laughs> okay, yeah, since, since I study black holes, um, we don't actually know what's happening inside a black hole. For those of you that maybe don't know what a black hole is, it is a body that is so dense and so massive in a small area that its gravity is so strong that if anything comes close to too close to it, including light, it gets sucked in, never to be seen again. And so, you know, that that border where things get too close is called the event horizon. And that's sort of what we consider the size of the black hole. But as scientists, when we measure the size of the black hole, we're not really talking about physical size. We're more talking about its mass and how much mass there is. And the more massive it is, the, the larger that, that diameter that light will never escape from. And, uh, you know, science gets weird inside a black hole. Um, 
when I was taking my general relativity class, I was amazed that one of the interpretations of the equations was that space-like dimensions become time-like and time-like dimensions become space-like. So that maybe if you could get into a black hole without being killed, which would be a trick because if you get too close to black hole, it stretches you out. So if you were going like feet first to a black hole, you'd be stretched out and your feet would go towards the black hole faster than your head. It would be spaghettified. You'd stretch out and it'd stretch you out and be very painful and be a very ugly death. Um, but, uh, but if you could get inside, maybe you'd be able to travel through time. Um, and this was depicted in some sense in the, the very uh, popular movie Interstellar where they tried to show what things looked like inside a black hole, which I think they did a remarkably good job of showing black hole physics and time dilation and all the other weird things that happen when you get really close to something massive. But do we actually know what's inside a black hole? No, and I'm not sure we'll ever figure it out because it's a boundary that once you go in there, you can't get out and you can't tell people what you find. Okay, cool. Um... Another question is, can a black hole suck in another black hole? And what happens when two black holes collide? Sure, so I can probably take a stab at this one. Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, to, uh, two black holes can, uh, can collide, they can merge. And effectively what you end up with when that happens is a larger black hole. You get two black holes combining together and you end up with uh, a single black hole uh, with the combined mass of the two. And um, one of the interesting things uh, that, that, um, that, that happens uh, when you get these small objects kind of colliding and, and merging is you can uh, create uh, what are called gravitational waves. So um, we know light doesn't escape from, from black holes. But as they as they orbit each other and as they come closer and closer and actually end up colliding and merging, they create ripples in in the effectively the fabric of space. They they create gravitational ripples that we can uh, now detect. So we have things like uh, LIGO and Virgo that are experiments here on Earth designed to look for these gravitational waves from uh, from uh, colliding small objects like black holes and neutron stars and and uh, so basically you have these huge structures where you shine laser light down uh kilometer long arms and look at the differences the, the minuscule differences in in length between arms at kind of right angles and we can detect um the collisions of black holes and neutron stars so you may have seen this in the last couple of years um big announcements from, from LIGO and Virgo about these detections. Um, and so this is exciting because it opens up a whole new space of, uh, of, of astronomy. It's, we, we don't just have to look at light now, we can look at gravitational waves from uh, colliding black holes. All right, awesome. Uh, a couple more questions on black holes. Um, let's see. So how does a black hole form? And also, how big is a black hole? Well, that's a good question. There, in fact, are more than one type of black hole. And uh, some of it is still kind of under debate. And then in recent months, even, we've, we've discovered what we think are suggestions of intermediate mass black holes as well. So typically, there are uh, things on the what we call comparable in mass, as Ali mentioned, to stars, the mass of a star. And above a certain mass, maybe five to eight times the mass of our sun and greater, then often, depending on how the star evolves and reaches the end of its life or in the environment it's in, we can end up with a, with a, a black hole that is several times the mass of the sun or something like that. And we refer to those as stellar mass black holes. But there's another class of black hole that we know now um, that is inside the center of our own Milky Way galaxy at the core. This just received a Nobel Prize uh, this year for physics by researchers working at UC Berkeley and UCLA. Um, and this, this is a massive black hole that we're able to observe the stars in the environment of that 
black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And by watching how the orbits uh, evolve, we're able to determine how massive it is. And it's something like 4 billion times the mass of the sun. So we call that a supermassive black hole. So there is this category of stellar mass black holes. And then there are, there are these super massive black holes. And for a while, we'd been searching for where these black holes, where there may be intermediate scale black holes as well. And they were difficult to find, but there have been some indications in recent months now that maybe we're seeing some intermediate black holes as well. So I've answered the easy part of the question because I've described what they are and named them. How they form, well, maybe John, because he's a stellar mass person, he might be able to describe a little bit the environment and how stellar mass black holes form and how supermassive black holes form. There's still some research and debate going on. Do they form with the galaxy they're hosted in? We see evidence of that. Do they form when galaxies merge together in the early history of the universe? We've also seen evidence of that. So it's still a topic of active research at Lick Observatory and all around the world, really, to try and resolve those issues. And one of the tantalizing things is that we see evidence for all of these possible formation scenarios. And the short answer is we don't really definitively know, certainly for the supermassive black holes. Maybe John can say something about how the stellar mass black holes typically form. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so when, when stars die, <laughs> So, so stars, um, th there's a couple of ways that they can end their, 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 they can end their lives. So if you have small, small in stellar terms, stars like our sun, then they become red giants and they puff up and then eventually they puff off their outer layers and you're left with a, a white dwarf uh, behind, which just continues to cool off um, over, over time. But if you have larger stars, then you get into uh, what what Ellie mentioned earlier, the the supernovae. So you you, you get into actual the the uh, point where as the stars reach the end of their life, uh, they explode, and that releases huge amounts of energy. And we those are um, you know it's a, it's a big area of research looking for supernovae um, because they're bright enough that you can actually see them in distant galaxies. Um, they end up outshining uh, the the rest of the uh, galaxy that they're in. Um, but after that explosion happens, what you're left with at the end is uh, the, the core of the star. And depending on the size of that initial star, you're either left with a, a neutron star that is a small ball of basically just neutrons that's a couple of kilometers in size. Or if you have even larger um, stars, you end up with a, a black hole left behind. So it's the kind of the, the largest stars when they reach the end of their life and explode, you get a, a black hole uh, left behind. They are the, the remnants of the stellar explosions. All right, awesome. Uh, let's see, let's do one more about black holes. And then we've got a pretty good question about how elements are formed. Um, so when a black hole sucks in an object, where does the object's mass go? Does the black hole get bigger with every object it sucks in? So in general, yes. When black holes uh, suck in an object, um, it adds to the mass of the black hole. But it's usually a pretty dramatic event when um, something gets too close to a black hole, like uh, a star or a cloud of gas called a nebula in space. And we see this happening um, around these massive black holes at the centers of other galaxies and even our own galaxy. Um, so if a star gets too close because the, the side of the star that's closer to the black hole experiences more of a, a, a gravitational tidal force than the far side star, it gets stretched out in this process called spaghettification. And yes, that is a real term. Um, and, and it gets stretched out. And that stretching process generates a lot of heat and a lot of light. And so you'll see the area around a black hole get suddenly much brighter due to this object being sh shredded and it'll get brighter and then all of a sudden bits of it will disappear into the black hole because the light and the energy and the mass that's uh, uh, used to be the star ends up in the black hole 
Um, and so it does get a little bit bigger. And so this is part of the process we think is happening with these supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies, that they are getting more massive with time as they, you know, ingest some of the stars and gas around them. Um, but uh, they're limited. Eventually, you know, they absorb everything that's close enough. And then they end up being what we call quiescent black holes, that there's no longer any stuff being sucked in in any significant amount. And so it's just sitting there quietly as this big black thing that you can measure its mass, but you don't otherwise see it. All right. Um, this one's kind of a tricky one. So it's please summarize what's known about how trans iron elements are produced in the universe. That's a pretty specific question. And again, I, I uh, would suggest that we're still finding stuff out. So from my knowledge, I think the trans iron elements are typically done in the later stages of stellar evolution as stars kind of reach the end of their, uh, it's called main sequence burning. So as they exhaust their conventional fuel supply and become unstable, they start to uh, stratify and you start to get uh, layers, almost like an onion skin inside a star, as you get shells of different elements and at the interfaces of the different elements, you start to uh, have this chemical production line almost, all the way up to iron. Beyond iron, typically, you need these dramatic explosions or dramatic events at least, maybe not explosions, some of which are supernova sometimes that, that John was describing. And we're still learning about how these things occur and the different mechanisms. So you can have a supernova that, that occurs because it's just the end point of an isolated star's evolution, or it could have received material from a neighboring companion star. Um, and the explosion has been triggered at the surface rather than from deep within the core or deep within the star. And the chemical abundances and the chemistry that emerges from those type of events can be different and you can get radioactive elements as well that decay, decay at different speeds into you know from radioactive nickel into more stable iron and so on and also again with with some of our uc researchers in recent years watching some of these um uh, uh, neutron star merger events we're starting to learn that maybe large amounts of specific elements are very specific to only a certain type of event so recently, one of our uh, colleagues working down at Santa Cruz, Professor Enrico Ramirez, has uh, discovered that neutron star mergers seem to be uh, the, the cause of nearly all of the gold in the universe. And uh, that's an amazing discovery that you can isolate one event to produce this one element. Awesome. Um. Let's see. Uh, we have one saying, is Lick involved in dark energy or dark matter research? And what are the best current theories on the cause of dark energy? Well, I am not a particular expert on either. Um, and I think my, my colleagues also by our reticence to jump right in aren't either. Um, so Lick Observatory currently is not um, directly involved in much dark energy, dark matter research, um, except for the fact that we have an automated telescope called the Katzman Automatic Imaging Telescope. That's a robotic telescope that discovers supernova explosions. And there are two types of supernova explosions. John described one, which are when massive stars reach the end of their life and blow up. Um, but there's another kind called a, a supernova type 1A, which is when you have a white dwarf star and it has a companion star that's uh, expanded as it becomes a red, dwarf, uh, red giant star towards the end of its life and starts dumping matter onto the, the white dwarf star. And that, when it hits 1.4 times the mass of our sun, explodes. And those stars 
when they explode because they start with the same mass, always have the same intrinsic brightness. So they're sort of like a 100 watt light bulb. If it's really bright, it means it's nearby. If it's way, if it looks really faint, it's much further away. And so we can use these to measure the distance to the galaxy with reasonably high precision. And we can also measure how fast that galaxy is moving away from us due to the expansion of the universe. And there's, um, you know, 20 something years ago, they were studying this, trying to figure out, um, you know, what is the end of our universe? Is there enough mass in our universe that the expansion of the universe is slowing down? So the further away something is that the, the, you know, it's starting to slow down and will it eventually stop and will the universe end in the big crunch? Will everything eventually come back in together and, and uh, collapse again? Or is there not enough gravity and it'll expand forever, but it's always slowing down because of the gravity? And what they discovered, and this won the Nobel Prize in 2013 um, for, for astronomers at, at Lawrence Berkeley Labs and, and UC, uh, uh, UC Berkeley and, and other locations around the world um, who were involved in the project, um, they discovered that the universe actually isn't slowing down. It's in this, it's accelerating. It's actually expanding faster with time. And uh, so our contribution to dark energy research has been really in the discovery of dark energy in the first place. Uh, and uh, also in, you know, fine tuning our measurements, understanding those supernovae better so that we understand the little differences between them that might affect our distance measurements. Um, you know, I'm sure there are researchers in the University of California system that do much more extensive dark energy and dark matter research, but that is how Lick Observatory directly contributes right now. Yeah, and I'd say the dark matter, although it's not widely done here because it's almost accepted now among many astronomers. But uh, the, whereas Ellie's talking about the dark energy, which is on the universal scale, Lick and, and Mount Hamilton and University of California contributed, California contributed very significantly to the realization of dark matter. So for example, the first ever detection of dark matter on the, on the scale of a galaxy was performed right here in Santa Clara County on top of Mount Hamilton. and. Uh, people down in Southern California were doing work in the 1930s where they were measuring clusters of galaxies that were orbiting each other and realized that there must be more material there than we could see that was gravitationally holding everything together so they would stay bound. And that, that was, again, the suggestion of dark matter came for these clusters of galaxies. So we certainly have the capability to do these detections. Um, but I'm not sure whether we've got any really big active research groups using our facilities here at the mountain. We're a bit more specialized, but certainly astronomers in the UC system have access to do that kind of work. And I, I know I'm not a panelist, but I would just add to that, that um, since the discovery of dark matter um, in astrophysics, it's kind of become more of a particle physics uh, problem to solve because um, Astrophysics itself can't really um, can't really tell which particle it is that is dark matter. Um, so that's that's what they're looking for at CERN and in other particle accelerators to detect these dark matter particles. Okay, other questions? Um, we have a couple of follow up questions from earlier. Everybody's really interested in black holes. Um, and one is, how does a black hole die? So, it's theoretically possible for a black hole to die, and by dying means that a black hole would reduce its mass until it is no longer exists. Um, we have not seen that happen. Um, so, you know, mostly we see black holes getting bigger. That's an event that's easy to see in our universe. And Stephen Hawking, you know, through Hawking ra radiation and his theories, which I, I will admit I'm not an expert in, um, had a way of, of showing that black holes could evaporate and lose mass very slowly. 
but it's a very slow process. So whether our universe is going to be, you know, live, survive long enough for a black hole to ever evaporate to nothing um, is, is a good question that we don't know the answer to yet. Um, it's been theorized you could have micro black holes that could pop into existence that are tiny and then evaporate very quickly within seconds or minutes. Um, but we haven't seen those yet either, though some people were afraid that some of these particle accelerators, as they get more and more powerful to probe the, the extremes and you know, discover some of these new particles or, or um, dark matter particles or, or other things that are theorized that we haven't discovered yet, um, that they might generate some of these micro black holes. Um, now, I'm not familiar with the particular theories uh, yeah, that uh, you know, predict these, but it is an interesting possibility, um, not likely to be dangerous because these things will pop into existence and disappear pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, it, it certainly is fascinating and, and uh, one of the things we're, we're looking to learn more about. All right. Um, another follow-up is when a black hole spaghetti something it creates a lot of energy but why doesn't the black hole suck in that energy or I guess how much of that energy does it suck in? Ah, that's a good question. How much of the energy does it suck in? I actually don't know. Um, I'm sure there are theorists out there that are studying that but you know as the object is still outside the black hole and being it's, it's radiating emission in all directions and so the radiation that's emitted towards the black hole will get sucked in and everything that's being radiated away from it, um, you know, the rest of the universe can see if they're looking in the right direction. Um, so, you know, naively, I'd say, oh, well, it's going to be, you know, maybe less than half the energy and, you know, that's emitted in the spaghettification project might end up in the black hole. But um, I, I don't have an intuition for what percentage that would be. But most of the energy is actually going out in other directions. All right. Um, yeah, the, the closest estimate I had read before was that in an accretion disk around a black hole, um, matter will emit 10% of its mass in light. And so it would be like maybe 5% that we get. Um, and then the rest, the 95% would, would all get sucked up by the black hole. Um, let's see. Um, okay, probably we have time for a couple more questions. We have 10 minutes left. Um, one interesting one is why is there no gravity in space? <laughs> well, there is, it's just very low typically. So there's gravity pervading space everywhere. It's just as you get close to objects and the, the closer you are to a heavier object then the, the gravity that, that you feel or the bend in space time uh, is, is uh, more apparent closer to these larger massive objects but conceivably gravity has a field throughout space time. Okay, how close has anyone come to a black hole? Um, see, I thought I had a follow up somewhere. Yeah, okay, that's it. So how close has anybody come to getting into a black hole, or I guess? <laughs> I don't know, maybe John, you want to tackle that one or do you want me to tackle it? Uh, go ahead, because I actually <laughs> know what the closest black hole to us would be. Yeah, I, I can't than, actually uh, remember like, what our closest mass. black hole is. Our, our closest known black hole is in our own galaxy. It's one of these stellar mass black holes, but I can't remember if it's Cygnus X1 or if there's any closer. Um, certainly we, we know the existence of some of these smaller black holes near us because they have companion stars in orbit and, and there's some dynamics there that cause them to emit x-rays and, and uh, make them visible to us when otherwise they'd be sort of invisible. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we haven't gotten that far. I mean, the furthest from Earth human beings have traveled is the moon. 
And uh, it's been a long time since we've had any people set foot on the moon. Uh, NASA is currently looking at programs to send people back to the moon and even to Mars. Um, and getting to Mars, I mean, even though it's one of the closer planets in our solar system to us, is still a long, long journey. So we're, we're looking at, you know, the, the, you know anyone that's going to go to Mars and back, they're talking years of journey to get out there and come back. And it's very dangerous in space. So, um, you know, considering we, we've, we've barely touched our, our neighboring planets, uh, though we have sent space probes out now to all the major planets um, at some point or another between Voyager and New Horizons and various uh, space probes. Human beings haven't gotten very far. We're kind of fragile. And so we need real good technology to keep us safe if we're going to go to another planet. And of course, getting to another solar system, um, say going to Alpha Centauri or Proxima Centauri, which is the nearest star to our sun, um, you know, is, is, is four light years away. It means it takes light four years to travel between here and the nearest star. And it would take human beings much, much longer, probably tens of thousands of years to uh, make that journey. Um, and the nearest black hole is even further away than that. Um, so so we, 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 we need to discover some new physics, maybe warp drive like in Star Trek would be awesome, um, but we haven't discovered it yet. Uh, but boy, I would want to go if, if we do. <laughs> All right, probably have time for, actually, yeah, they've been going pretty fast, so maybe two more. Um, uh, follow up to the past question about gravity. If there is gravity in space, why do people say it's zero gravity? Because it's a very broad approximation, it is zero. Compared to what we experience on Earth, it is very, very low. For, for a human being, it's probably imperceptible that you can feel any gravity. But even the, the uh, astronauts on the International Space Station they, they still experience, but it's a very low gravity. So maybe a, a more appropriate term would be microgravity rather than zero gravity, but it's almost indistinguishable if you're in microgravity or low gravity. If on the moon, there is still gravity on the moon, right? You jump higher than you would on Earth, but you're still kind of fall back to the surface of the moon. All right, and then a last one is do Lick astronomers do most of their observations remotely or at the Mount Hamilton Observatory? So maybe John can pick this one up. So, uh, so right now, remotely, um, because of uh, the COVID situation, um, we don't uh, have astronomers up on the mountain. Um, myself, Ellie, and Paul live up here, but but the UC astronomers who use Lick for their research. Um, currently cannot come up here. Um, so they're all using the telescopes remotely. Um, in normal times, um, it is a mix. Um, remote observations are great. They're much more um, flexible than you know, having to travel all the way up to Mount Hamilton, especially for some of the, the further campuses. Um, so when I was in UCSD, you know, Lick was something like an eight or nine hour drive away. So that's you know, if, if you can stay home and, and still use the telescopes, that's great. Um, for training, for new observers, we typically would have them come up to the observatory so they can see the telescopes, they can get an idea of the, of, of the environment up here. Um, but remote observations are definitely becoming much more common um, in, in astronomy as a whole. Um, kind of the days of where you have to travel to do your observations are, are definitely rapidly being replaced by, by remote observations and by, um, by robotic observations. So, so even up here at Lick, we have the APF, the, the Automated Planet Finder um, that Ellie mentioned in her introduction. And so that telescope is entirely robotic. So no one comes up to use it. It's all done um, ro uh, robotically where you, you basically tell the telescope what you want to look at. And at some point it will go and observe that on its own. Um, so we're definitely moving much more in the the direction of remote and or robotic operations kind of as a whole. All right. Um, we do have one more question on gravitons, but we are four minutes from the end. So if you guys, yeah, I think you can get through it quickly. Oh, well, I don't know much about gravitons at all. So it won't be me that's answering that one. Yeah. <laughs> 
just here. explain gravitons, anything to do with gravitons. <laughs> yeah, my I don't have much knowledge on gravitons other than the very basic that they're sort of the glue that is a particle associated with gravity. Um, most forces, according uh, um, to, to particle theory, um, have particle intermediaries. And gravitons, if I recall correctly, are that gravitational particle that sort of glues that force together. And they have not been discovered yet. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do with these big particle accelerators is discover gravitons. Um, and that's, you know, it'd be nice because it'd make sure, you know, it'd be nice to unify gravity with particle physics and the other forces. Um, and so this is a huge question in physics that uh, has not been answered yet. And I think I have now more than explained my full knowledge about gravitons. <laughs> All right, so with that, I think we will wrap up then. Um, thank you guys. Uh, thank you to the panelists for, for volunteering for this. And thank you to everybody in the audience um, who came for our session. Thank yeah, you. I thought there were great questions and hopefully some of the people who are on the panel are observing this, they'll be joining us in a few years time to help solve some of the answers we were giving. Because most of the answers we were giving were like, well, we don't know, we're still working on it. <laughs> but, uh, we need people to come and help us solve some of these problems. Yeah, and that's part of what makes astronomy so exciting is there is so much we don't know and we keep discovering new things, which opens up new questions because like, oh, that didn't work quite the way we thought. So it, it keeps it exciting all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thank yes. you. <laughs>